Welcome back. Um, after writing 15 new lectures and um, recording all 15 of them, I'm starting to get a bit tired. So I think my background is pointing to the fact that I need to go on holidays and spend some time sitting on the beach. And hopefully you all get to at some point in the future as well. Um, one of the difficult things in Japan is actually finding beaches. Um, a lot of the coastline is developed in such a way as to protect um, the shore from tsunami, which you often get when you have large earthquakes in that um, area of the world. And so um, while I was there, I decided to take a little bit of an adventure to see if I could find some good beaches. Um, one, of the, one of those was, you've seen in a past lecture, I went up to Hachinohe, about as far north as you can go, because uh, there's actually quite a few nice beaches and coastline up there. And there's actually some good beaches within um, about an hour or so of Tokyo as well. And so this one is in a little town called Kamakura, um, right down on the coast. And um, Kamakura is a bit of a tourist attraction in its own right. Most people go to see sort of the, the giant Buddha that um, was built several hundred years ago. Um, and um, that's not my favorite tourist attraction in the town, actually. There's a little temple a bit further down the road from that called Hasadera. Um, it's definitely worth a look, but the giant Buddha's might as well go while you're there. Um, Kamakura is a fantastic day trip. If you can stay the weekend, even better. And if you can get it at a time of year when it's good for the beach, definitely. Um, even if you don't like to swim, you can always just have a good party on the beach like those guys. All right. Um, so this in this last half, I want to step it up a little bit more. I want to look at some slightly more um, complicated rotate rotational scenarios. And it's less to do them properly and more to look at how complicated this can get so that if you ever have to deal with these problems, you know that the tools exist. And one of the funny things about undergraduate education is that you come into it thinking you're going to learn heaps of physics. And once you've done it and you've gone on, you've become a postgrad and you've done whatever and you've become a professor for a few years and taught it, you realize that actually you don't learn so much as an undergraduate. What you learn is about the things that you should know and you can go back later and learn properly, right? And so in a lot of cases in your lecture courses, this is exactly what we're doing. We're giving you a first exposure to ideas for not a lot more reason than to know that the idea exists and to see the problem solving approaches that are connected to it. Because if you're ever gonna need to use it, you're gonna have to come back and spend a little more than a half an hour, an hour. You're probably gonna have to spend you know, a week or whatever on it. And if you're dealing with research problems, you really will. You will sink you know, entire days into teaching yourself something very, very detailed. And um, also there just so that you know what tools are available to you if you have to deal with problems. And many of you will go on to become engineers and you will be dealing with rotational mechanical problems all the time. So it's good to know that these things exist. Okay. And so we're going to do two things today. First, we're going to look at Euler angles. I'm not going to do them properly because I don't have the time to do the full mathematics. And the approach that's taken in a lot of the books is not the best approach to do it anyway, in my opinion. Um, and the other is we're going to have another look at precession um, in a top like we did in the last lecture again and extract out a little bit of behavior that comes on top of that and an effect that we call mutation. Okay, so let's get rolling into this. Um, Euler equations can be painful because they refer to axes that are fixed inside the body, right? Um, and you, if you think back, if I, can, if I had to go back and criticize the last half hour of lecture I just gave, the one criticism I would give to myself is I was a little um, a little ambiguous about what was going on with the axes. And the reason why I say that is because if I scroll back up through my notes, you'll notice that I'm using ones and twos and threes connected to my lambdas and my omegas. But when I do my cross product here, for example, I slip into notation of i, j, k, and I slip into it just because that's how I know how to do cross products. But really what the axes are in that cross product is e1, e2, e3. And I'm really thinking about the E1, E2, E3 directions attached to my rotating body. And um, all of those equations that we write up in here um, to solve these, these sorts of problems are actually connected to the rotating reference frame of that body. And in a lot of cases, you don't want to work in that because you're basically, you're 
um, reference frame is changing all the time, particularly if you're interested in other dynamics external to that spinning object. And so you need a way to basically convert from rotating reference frames to non-rotating frames and change, transform between the two coordinate systems in some very effective way. And the approach that's usually used to do this is something called Euler angles, and it's often considered an advanced topic in um, most mechanics books because two reasons actually. One is it's just trig, but it's v or trigonometry. It's just very hard trig, and the other is that um, there's better ways to do it if you really have to do it. And those of you who've seen um, rotational matrices and connect back to the last lecture where you can see that a lot of this stuff is basically just linear algebra, right? So if we even go back to the Euler's equations of the first half of the lecture, we had three equations. Um, we can basically treat that as um, sort of, you know, matrix equations. And then what we can do is just introduce rotational matrices that execute our Euler angles here, okay? Um, it's a long, tedious mathematical lecture with lots of signs and causes in it, and I really don't like to bore people with it. So if you ever have to do it, do it. If you don't, what I'm going to do today is just show you the approach. I'm going to pull out a couple of relationships that I need for the last part so that we can go somewhere, and then leave this as a tool for you to play with if you ever need it. And if you never need it, then hey, great, you just know it exists and it's kind of cool, okay? So Euler angles basically result, um, rely on the fact that you take three steps to switch from your inertial reference frame to any particular position of your rotational frame relative to that inertial frame. Okay, So one of them is that there's going to be, um, you start with your body axes aligned to your space axes. So imagine that we've got, um, uh, I'll go to this one because it's more feasible. Um, imagine you've got an object that you're interested in and you want to relate it to your inertial reference frame. What you do is you go, I'm going to start with it aligned with my inertial reference frame and I know that I have to execute a set of rotations to get it to go from where it is aligned in my reference frame to its position in that, um, in that actual rotational motion, right? And so... Um, there will actually be three. You've got a tip, turn, and um, tilt, right? Um, and so basically the way this works is you start with your body axes, uh, E1, E2, E3, sitting at the same origin um, and aligned with your X, Y, and Z, and then you work out what rotations you have to do to get to, to map to the position that you're interested in your current rotational problem. And so these will f go as a function of time too, which is why they can be really painful to deal with. So the first step here is you basically take your um, E3, E1, E2 and you rotate around the Z axis. Then you tip E3 out from Z, um, just like you have in here. And then you rotate um, E2 and E3 around um, your E3 axis and that will get you to any position that you're interested in, right? And you can imagine there's lots of different ways you could do this, but this is the convention for doing it. And what you do is you have three angles in that case, you call them phi, theta, and psi, and you work them out by doing these steps, okay? Um, what we end up with when we do this is... Um, Um, a translation that looks a little bit like this. Um, first we start with phi. And in step A we're rotating um, by phi relative to the z-axis, right? So what we're going to have here is a vector, um, omega A, that is phi dot um, z hat, okay? And just to make this clear, we're, we're dealing with a dynamical problem. So you'll notice when I talked before, how do I get from this axis to a position at some point in time? Because I've got a dynamical problem, I'm doing that all the time. And so what I can do is just ask sequentially, if I keep doing this process, how does that dynamically change, right? So what I'm gonna do here is use the Euler angles to relate, um, um, sort of 
change in angle with respect to time to an angular velocity. All right. So that's our first one. If you've you, 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 your um, uh, angular frequency or your angular velocity um, in the first change a will just be the change d phi on dt um, about this axis z because that's the axis of rotation. Okay. Um, then in B, what we're going to do now is we're going to go um, by a theta about this axis E2 dash. Okay, so we've now got a um, omega B is um, theta dot E2 dash, and a little hat on there just to make it clear it's a um, unit vector. And then the last step in here is we're now rotating about our E3 for this last angle, right? So our omega C is going to be um, psi dot um, E3 hat, okay? And you'll notice that I'm distinguishing between my final E2 and my intermediate E2 by giving it a dash, okay? So um, just to keep track of where things are going um, on the way through this problem. So to get our final angular velocity, what we do is um, add the angular velocities from each of the steps to each other, right? So um, basically you can imagine, you know, if I want a spinning object that's at some um, angle relative to my inertial reference frame, I need to spot a spin in one direction, I need to spot a spin in the other direction, I need to start a spin in the other direction. I'm adding three angular momentums together to get the last one, right? So my overall angular momentum here is going to be angular momentum A plus angular momentum B plus angular, moment, uh, angular velocity C. Angular velocity and angular momentum. It's easy to get them mixed up. Okay. And of course we can add these things together, right? So phi dot um, z hat plus theta dot e2 dash hat plus psi dot um, e hat 3. Okay. All right, it's a bit ugly. Um, we've basically got um, an angular momentum for some rotating object relative to an inertial reference frame that's made up of three different angles. Okay, we can deal with that. With three different unit vectors that are not even necessarily orthogonal to one another, they're pointing in all sorts of funny directions, right? You can, you can see here that Z is not orthogonal to E3 and neither of them, um, actually E3 is orthogonal to E2 and E2 is orthogonal to Z, but you know we've got this complicated um, setup in this space. What we can do is then build relationships between those vectors, right? Um, so we've got um, E2 hat dash is equal to minus sine theta cos, oh, no, so sine, um, sine phi x. I'm going to speed up a little bit here because I've got past the basic concept of Euler equations and now I'm into just making mathematical relationships and it'll get a bit boring if I don't move a little quickly. Um, sine theta um, cos phi y. Okay, And so this relationship that I just wrote just here is really just a projection of um, E2 into the y and x components so I can relate those two things together. Okay. Um, and I can write an E3 here, sine theta cos phi x um, plus sine theta sine phi y plus cos theta z hat. Okay. And in this case, what I'm doing is um, so the first one I basically. Um, projected uh, e2 back e2 dash back to my x and y so I need to use theta and um, phi here in my last one I'm connecting e3 which is my final vector here back to x and y and z so I need to undo my psi undo my theta and undo my phi and so I have trig components of those in the last equation right um, there's two ways to get this one is very tedious thinking about 
um, trigonometric angles, which I'll let you bore yourself with. Or the other one is if you've got um, in a position to do a more um, linear algebra approach, you can just use rotational matrices and they just pop out quite nicely um, out of that. So if we bring all this together, um, what we will have here is omega is equal to um, sine theta um, phi dot cos phi minus theta dot sine phi um, x hat um, plus um, psi dot sine phi minus theta dot cos phi um, y hat um, close the bracket there plus um, phi dot cos theta plus phi dot like so. Okay, what did we learn here? We basically found that A, this is very complicated and so if you're ever going to use this you would go and look it up in a book and set it to your specific problem, right? Um, it gets rather difficult rather quickly. We can also reverse our relations in here um, and I'm trying to head to something that I'm going to need for the last part of this lecture um, at the moment. So let's have a B and what we can do in here is, is use two relations that we can pull out in a similar way. One is that Z hat is um, cos theta E3 minus sine theta E1 and the other is that E2 dash is sine phi e1 um, plus cos phi uh, psi e2 like so okay and if I use those two things then what I can do is take the x and y and z that turn up in a and convert this thing into um, e1 e2 e3 okay so this thing is now um, minus phi dot sine theta cos um, plus theta dot sine uh, psi e1 um, minus phi dot um, sine theta um, sine psi minus theta dot sine psi e2 um, plus psi dot um, plus phi dot cos theta, let me just make the dot clear up there, um, e3 hat, okay? So that's another way to write this thing. And we've got one last step in here, um, which is basically a simplification off the fact that we're going to deal with a problem that's kind of useful in a minute, which is that lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2. And if that's the case, then any two perpendicular, any two axes perpendicular to um, e3 will be um, principal axes, okay? So um, if I come into this plane, I've now got um, lambda 1 equals lambda 2, and so any two axes in this plane I can set as um, those two directions. And so if you think back to my football at the moment, because it's the one that I like it, even though it goes invisible because it's got the right symmetry and the lemon bottle doesn't quite... Um, You'll notice that I can choose this and this as lambda 2 and lambda 1, or I could choose this and this as lambda 2 or lambda 1, or I could choose that and that, okay? It doesn't really matter where I put those principal axes around here because of that axial symmetry, okay? Um, and so if I do that, um, I can get a, an expression on the end here, which is the one that I'm going to continue using for the rest of um, this lecture. It's um, minus phi dot sine theta, um, e1 hat dash plus, uh, this is a phi, actually it's a theta, um, theta dot e2 hat um, dash plus um, psi dot plus phi dot cos theta e3 hat, okay? And which of those three you would use depends on the specific problem. So um, a very sensible question for a savvy student in lecture theatre to ask right now would be, that's nice, Adam, but what do you want me to take away from this? And what I want you to take away from this is the same thing that I took away from it when I was um, an undergraduate, which is, um, one, 
rotational dynamics problems get very, very tricky very, very quickly if you don't have nicely constrained um, limits on the motion. If you do, you have to be very careful about how to connect your two coordinate systems to each other. You, you sometimes want to deal with your co-rotating frame, sometimes you want to go back to your inertial frame. You sometimes have to go between the two, and if you have to go between the two, there exists a convention for how to do it, and it's this thing called Euler angles. And the last one is, it's atrociously difficult. Someone has already gone and done the hard work of working out how to make these things. And so if you ever need them, the thing to do is to go and look them up in a book, find somebody else's work and apply them to your problem, right? And this is why Euler angles problems rarely make good exam problems, because one, you have to look them up, two, they take ages, um, and three, most of it's maths and it's not a lot of physics built into it, right? But if you're dealing with real world problems, you know, you're launching a satellite into space or you're um, dealing with ballistic problems or something like that, then you really do care about this sort of thing. You actually do need to think about the dynamics and sometimes it's complicated and you need to know that these tools exist and the basics of how to use them, okay? So this is there. If you ever need it, you know that it's there. Where I want to go from here is back to my motion of a spinning top. And the reason why I brought up Euler angles is because I kind of need them for this problem to get the last thing out of the problem, okay? So here we are back with our spinning top again. And just to define this problem again like, um, on top of yesterday, what we have is a disc with a spindle running through it. The spindle goes through this, um, sits at this point O. The object is spinning around an axis E3. And at the same time, it's sort of falling under gravity. So there's a force acting on its center of mass. Okay, And its center of mass is not necessarily at the middle of the disc. Um, the force acting on the center of mass is actually trying to pull it out of, um, down towards the xy plane, okay? And so the one thing that won't have been obvious yesterday but will be very obvious today is this is my space coordinate system or space reference frame here, x, y, z. And I would have here a um, body frame that's E3, E1, E2. And of course, because I've got axial symmetry now, as we just talked about, um, E2 and E3 can be any direction I like in that direction. And so that's why in this diagram they don't specify E2 and E3, because you don't have to. They can be any direction you like in that plane when you have axial symmetry. Okay. All right. So we're going to go back and, and have a look at this, but now we're going to do it a little bit from our Euler um, angles perspective so that we can pull out a little bit more about the dynamics of the motion in this case. Okay. So we've got lambda 1 equals lambda 2. And that means that we can start from um, an omega that's a little bit different to the one we had yesterday. You remember yesterday what we did was make our omega 0, 0 and omega 3. Here what we're going to do is we're actually going to be setting it up so we can connect it to our inertial reference frame um, later on via our Euler angles. Okay, So this thing would be um, minus phi dot sine theta um, E1 dash plus theta dot E2 hat dash plus psi dot um, plus phi dot cos theta E3 hat. Okay? And of course, the angular momentum would come out in the usual way. We're dealing with principal axes here. So this would be lambda 1, omega 1, lambda 2, omega 2, lambda 3, omega 3. And of course, this would be a vector in E1, E2, E3, right? Just to be very, very clear. Um, this L that we have is now in our body frame. It's not in our space frame. Um, even though we know right across product, I might have I, J, K across the top of it, um, falling into bad habits. Okay, so we could go through here and um, include the lambdas in on the omega above to write an expression for the angular momentum. Okay, I'll do that in my notes. I won't rewrite that again here now. Okay, so we're going to need a few things later on in this problem 
And so I'm going to build them up slowly as we go along. And we're going to do this as a Lagrangian problem. So um, what I'll do is set this up so that you can see what a really ugly um, and hard Lagrangian problem looks like um, by the end of the course, because we've done quite a few trivial ones. So later on, we're going to need the Z component um, of my angular momentum. And so we can get that out by taking um, the dot product of L and the unit vector Z. Okay, and this is a way to get any um, any component, and of course, because it's a because we're taking a dot product here, it's a scalar, so we're getting a magnitude for it. Um, what we'll need as part of this is that um, e1 hat dash z uh, z is minus sine theta, um, e2 hat dash dot z is zero. And e3 hat dash dot z is cos theta. Okay, and again, you would just get these out by geometry if you were doing this, right? You could set this as an assignment problem. It would be a kind of a nasty assignment problem because you'd have to spend forever working out trigonometric relationships. So what our, what will happen here is our L z will now look like um, lambda one uh, phi dot sine squared theta plus lambda 3 um, psi dot plus phi dot cos theta cos theta. And so all I've really done here is basically take this term, multiply it by lambda 1, and then multiply it by the minus sine theta here to get me that term. The middle term in here gets cancelled by that 0 on the E2. And then this last term on the end here is basically this last term on the end multiplied by lambda 3 to get me to an angular momentum and then multiplied by this geometric factor to convert it from um, to convert it into my z component okay and just to keep track of this thing let's call this equation 2 and we can call this angular momentum up here ang um, equation 1 um, just to compare to my notes um, all right what we can do is write this thing that we just got here as lambda 1 phi dot sine squared theta plus L3 cos theta, where we now have this thing L3, um, which is just um, lambda 3 psi dot plus phi dot cos theta. Okay? Um, and of course we can take the equation that we just wrote number two and solve um, for phi dot and that will give us um, phi dot is equal to lz minus l3 cos theta on um, lambda 1 sine squared theta like so okay and let's call this three because we're going to use this down below as well to deal with our problem Okay, whole pile of setup on um, Euler, Euler angles. Um, if you were ever doing a problem like this for real, you would, you would take your time and work your way through step by step and double check and do this again and again, right? And so if you come to my office and have a look at my research logbook, um, you'll notice that there's problems I've been doing really recently that are electrostatic problems connected to biophysics, for example, and I have, you know, nearly a hundred pages of book working out geometric factors for this and that, calculating various things, putting approximations in, that sort of stuff, right? We do this for real. It takes a long time. You can fill an entire hundred page book with just working out all the factors that are required to solve these problems. And this is why exams can be misleading as an undergraduate, because the problems are never that easy in real life. Okay, so we're going to do this with a, with a Lagrangian. And so normal approach we don't want a kinetic energy, so um, this will be because we're dealing with principal axes. We can write this fairly straightforwardly. It's um, lambda one omega one squared plus lambda two omega two squared plus lambda three omega three squared, like so. Okay, so this is using this expression we got yesterday um, of omega dot um, l, and we can fill our terms into this thing. So this is going to be a half lambda one. Um, phi dot squared sine squared theta um, plus a half lambda two theta dot squared um, 
plus a half lambda three um, psi dot plus phi dot cos theta squared. Okay, rather complicated equation, but we can pull all the terms into this thing. And then we know that lambda 1 is equal to lambda 2. We've got axial symmetry in this problem. So we can actually simplify this one step further. We've got unscheduled color change. Um, a half lambda 1 um, phi dot squared sine squared theta plus theta dot squared. It's the double tap on the pencil. I worked it out a couple of days ago. Um, the random color changes. I won't miss them when I finish this. Um, psi dot plus phi dot cos theta squared. Okay, um, so there's our kinetic energy. Our potential energy looks kind of simple here, right? It's just mgr cos theta. Okay, and we can see that in here um, we've got um, mgr. And then we've got a cos theta term um, basically to drag the force into this um, up-down direction in here. And you'll notice we've been kind of cunning in here um, so that I don't have to recycle theta. I've made that theta the same theta that I have in my Euler angle problem, okay? So um, this theta that I have in my um, potential energy is actually one of the Euler um, angles in my problem. Okay, so then we can write a Lagrangian for this. And before I write a Lagrangian for this, I just want to think back a step or two, because this, this is kind of an important point. When you start on a Lagrangian problem, you work out what your degrees of freedom are, right? And when we're dealing with this spinning top problem, we actually have three degrees of freedom, and the three degrees of freedom are the Euler angles, right? Um, you've got, well, I mean, you can see it in multiple ways. One would be rotation about E3, one about E2, one about E1. But you can also translate that into um, components in your Euler angles. So what we're actually using here in our Lagrangian is three generalized coordinates that are basically theta, phi, and psi. Um, our Lagrangian is just T minus U. So it's um, half lambda 1 phi dot squared sine squared theta plus theta dot squared plus a half um, lambda 3 um, psi dot plus phi dot cos theta squared uh, minus mgr cos theta. Okay, really hard Lagrangian problem structured in terms of a Lagrangian. So we've got three coordinates here, um, theta, phi, and psi. And you can imagine I'd write all three Euler-Lagrange equations and then go through and solve them and do whatever's in here, right? I'm not going to do that because I don't care about everything in the problem. And so this is another one of these cases we sometimes do in physics of just being selective about what it is that we want to solve. So um, what we're going to do is deal with our theta equation in this particular case. and um, so we can come in here and um, I'm going to skip a couple of steps and just jump straight to what that Euler-Lagrange equation looks like. So it's going to be lambda 1 theta double dot um, is equal to lambda 1 phi dot squared sine theta cos theta minus lambda 3 um, psi dot plus phi dot cos theta um, phi dot sine theta plus m g r sine theta. Okay, you can do this one as an exercise for yourself tonight. Um, make sure you take the derivatives properly and, and get the terms. Okay, it's probably one of the most useful things of the lot is just to practice taking a really hard Lagrangian and getting the derivatives from it to get the Euler-Lagrange equation um, in, in good pace. So um, this would be number four here now. Okay, um, there's no terms in phi and um, psi, so we can pretty much go straight to generalized momenta in this particular case here, right? So P of phi here is going to be D 
um, L on D phi. So now we're thinking about the phi equation, but we're not going to write the whole phi equation. Okay. Um, and so what I'm really saying here is my D on D T part is um, is is not turning up in this problem. Okay. So this is this bit here. Um, lambda one phi dot um, sine squared theta plus lambda three psi dot um, plus phi dot um, cos theta cos theta is a constant. Okay, so this would be one of these classic cases we've had where d on dt of dl on d phi dot um, minus dl on d phi equals zero, where this term here, because it's got no dependence on um, because there's no um, phi terms, that goes, I can automatically take the um, integral of this and make this become a constant. And that's basically what I've done just up on the line above. Okay. Um, once you've done mechanics problems for a while, you just skip those steps and go straight to, to the approach there. Okay. And you'll notice that this thing um, that we've written up the top here is just LZ. Okay, so all that equation says is that LZ equals a constant or that um, our um, Z component of the angular momentum is conserved. That's all it really gives us. Okay, and then we can do the similar thing for our um, psi equation. We know there's no terms in psi. So we can go direct to just considering um, P psi, which is just DL on D psi dot. And of course it comes out to be something even easier. It's lambda three um, psi dot plus phi dot cos theta. And that will be equal to a constant as well, right? Um, very similar approach. And basically what this says, this thing here is my L3, so L3 is constant or my L3 is conserved. Okay, so what I'm really saying here is that my angular momentum about this three direction is conserved and my angular momentum around this Z direction is conserved, right? Um, so I've just popped out to angular momentum conservation relations that make perfect sense with what we would understand in here. And of course, L3 is equal to lambda 3 omega 3. So what this says is that omega 3 is um, a constant. And that makes sense as well, because this top spinning on its axis is going to keep roughly its angular velocity as it processes around the system. And so that makes sense. Okay, So fairly hefty um, Lagrangian problem, um, but it pops out sensible answers as we come along through here. Okay, so there's two cases um, now, just to finish off quickly, that I want to look at. Um, one is what we call steady precession. And if you remember back to yesterday's lecture, I don't want to show the video again, um, just to save some time. Um, I had the video in there where we looked at the top processing um, and when we had it and we started it, you'll notice that it sort of bounced around a bit before it started processing in a clean, steady motion, right? So what I'm considering now is this steady precession limit where we basically go, the precession is going to be such that the angle theta is fixed, right? Um, in other words, this angle here is not um, doing anything f funny there. Um, And so what we want to do is trace a, a, um, a cone of um, constant theta. So if we have a look back up above, um, and let me just number a couple of equations in here. I'm going to call this one 5, and I'm going to call this one 6, just to keep track of them. Um, if we go back up to equation 3, which is up here, 
Um, what we know is that if um, if theta is a constant, then um, this will be fixed, and the um, trig relation on the bottom will be fixed, and LZ and L3 are conserved, we showed that, and lambda 1 is fixed because it's a geometrical parameter, okay? So then our phi dot will equal a constant as well, okay? Um, and so what we can say down here is if theta equals constant, then theta, uh, sorry, phi dot is equal to a constant, and we can call that constant something, we'll call it omega, okay? Because I, I ultimately know where the answer is going to be in this. Okay, so that comes from 3. If we go back up to equation 6 here for a second, um, what you'll notice is that if um, my phi dot is, is constant, um, and my angular momentum here is conserved, so it's a constant, then this must be a constant as well, right? So what we can say is from equation 6, if phi dot is a constant, then psi dot is a constant as well. Um, and if we consider that just in terms of our Euler angles, what we're basically saying here is that uh, this angle here um, has a, a constant velocity of change, right? Because um, it's psi dot that's the constant there. If we now go back up to equation 4 here for a moment, what we know is that that must be constant, that must be constant, that must be constant, that must be constant, and we can work our way through this whole problem into all the little bits that are in there, right? Um, and so what we know is that um, if theta equals constant, then um, theta double dot is going to be equal to zero. And if we use our terms that are in there, um, phi dot equals omega and um, psi dot plus phi dot cos theta equals omega 3, then we end up with a new equation down here, lambda 1 phi squared, uh, sorry, omega squared sine theta cos theta minus uh, lambda 3 omega 3 um, omega sine theta plus mg r sine theta equals zero, okay? And so this actually comes from four, okay? So let's just scroll back up. So what I've done in here is basically worked this thing out um, and used the fact that um, this term here is going to be zero of logical argument, okay? And of course, um, we can go through and extract the common um, term of sine theta in here out, so what we get is lambda 1 uh, omega squared cos theta minus lambda 3 omega 3 uh, omega plus mgr equals 0, and we can call this equation 7 real quick, okay? Alright, equation 7 is a quadratic, and if we want to solve this equation, then we um, basically need to go through and solve um, a nice big quadratic equation in here, right? What we can do is we can make A equals lambda 1 cos theta. We can make B equals minus lambda 3 omega 3. And we can make C equal mgr in here, right? All right. Um, if omega 3 is large, and we often deal with this problem in this limit because otherwise the problem just becomes very, very difficult to do. We end up in a case where um, b squared minus 4ac, which is um, the term inside the square root when you solve a quadratic equation, is going to be much bigger than zero, right? And it's going to be much bigger than zero because this omega 3 is going to contribute more relative to these terms in the A and the C um, in this thing, okay? 
And so what we have here actually is just b squared is much bigger than 4ac. And we know with quadratics, the flip, which side of that is on is um, kind of interesting, okay? So there's going to be two solutions in here. We've got, we're solving our quadratic, it looks like this, um, minus b squared plus or minus, um, actually it's minus b, minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac squared 4ac on 2a. Okay, it's one of the few equations that I memorized, but that's because I've been using it ever since high school. Um, and there's going to be two solutions in here because of the plus and the minus. Okay, um, and what we're going to do, you can see we've got a very difficult problem in here, and solving it exactly is going to be kind of horrible, right? I'll let you do this for yourself or have a look at my notes. If you substitute the a, the b, and the c into this quadratic um, equation solution here, you get this monster, and it's ugly, and you just don't know where to go with it. So what we're going to do here is take an omega minus and an omega plus, and we're going to take some approximations around this thing, right? So this would be minus b minus square root b squared minus 4ac on 2a. And what we know is that b squared is much bigger than 4ac, so it might as well be b squared. Square root of b squared is b. So this is going to be minus b minus b on 2a, right? Basic approximation. We've basically just said that b squared minus 4a squared, 4ac is b squared. And of course, then this is minus 2b on 2a, which is minus b on a. Really easy solution, okay? Um, one thing to keep in mind is sometimes as you go through physics, the more important thing is how to use approximations to make problems tractable than it is to know how to build problems. Um, most of the times when you're doing problem solving, particularly in you know third year and honors, you're actually using these sorts of approaches to simplify problems that are just way too hard to solve. Okay, you can imagine, all right, what we're gonna do now is use the same trick for the other side. And if we do that, it's gonna fall apart on us, right? Because now we would have b squared minus 4ac, 4ac becomes b squared, square root of b squared is b, but now we've got minus b plus b becomes zero, and so that second term becomes zero, right? It's not a good approximation because it basically makes the problem vanish. Um, so what we're gonna do here is um, take a slight detour. We're gonna do b squared minus 4ac here, and we're gonna call this b 1 minus 4ac on b squared to the half. And we know that um, if we have 1 minus x to the half, um, this thing is roughly equal to 1 minus a half x. Okay, And this is again where this tip comes that I say about, you know, keep a book, keep all these little tricks in them. When you get to exam periods, spend half a day reminding yourself of all the little tricks because sometimes you want to know which is the right approximation to use to get a solution to the problem. Okay, If we use this one, what we get from the line up above here is um, b 1 minus 2ac on b squared. This is going to be equal to b minus 2ac on b as a um, fraction. And now we can go back to our omega plus and it's going to be um, minus b plus b minus 2ac on b on 2a. And if you work this out, this is now minus c on b, which is a more useful answer than zero, okay? So what we've done is had to take an approximation, we have to take an approximation that keeps the problem alive in some sort of sense. Okay, what we can do now is basically take what we got here, what we got here, and substitute our answers in, okay? So we've got omega minus is going to be um, plus lambda 3 omega 3 on lambda 1 cos theta. And it's the larger of the two. And we've got an omega plus in here. And it's now minus mgr on um, minus lambda 3 omega 3. Okay, And in, it simplifies to become basically mgr on lambda 3 omega 3. Like so. Okay, um, And this is the smaller one. 
And if we just stop for a second and have a quick think about this, what we've got out of one sim single problem is both of the types of precession, right? We had the precession that we had in the last lecture, lecture 14, where we had a gravitational force. So we've got like a lower frequency, because it's the smaller of the two roots here, lower frequency gravity driven precession. And then we've got a higher frequency precession in here that's got no force terms in it, right? It's got lambda 3, omega 3, lambda 1, cos theta in it. And so this is the free precession that we saw in the first half of the lecture. And both of these things pop out neatly when you construct the problem properly. Okay? It's a slightly more advanced problem now. You can pop out both pieces rather than having to do them as simple problems where you get them each individually. You just have to be a bit more fierce with your mathematics and a bit more resolved to get into the toughness of the problem. Okay? So that's a nice answer we get there. So one last thing I want to get to here, which is mutation, okay? And so I'm not going to do this in full because this is an even longer problem and um, I think I've kind of worn out my welcome on demonstrating for today um, how hard these problems can get. Um, so I'm, I'm just going to kind of wave my hands around this one a little bit to show you the way you would approach it, okay? Um, You'll remember up and above in this problem here, and if I think to myself for a second now about the one thing that I probably didn't explain very well when I did it, um, it's, it'll be this. In, in the steady precession problem, what we did here was we went, okay, we require, we require theta to be constant, right? So what we want is this to precess around and hold this cone. And if, we, if that's gonna be the case, then theta dot has to be zero, and theta double dot has to be zero, okay? So requiring it to go around that cone means that theta double dot is equal to zero, and that is how I get this bit here, okay? Just in case that flew over some of you, flew over your head for some of you. Um, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna relax that requirement, right? And that of course is gonna make things rather difficult because um, I could simplify this equation up here um, in the steady precession case by making this zero because then it gave me um, a DE that looks like this now where I've got a zero on the end and that gives me something that's a quadratic that I can then solve and I did what I did to solve that quadratic, right? And the quadratic then pops out the two types of precession. But what I'm going to do now is um, I'm going to assume that theta doesn't have to be a constant, okay? So I'm going to let this thing be able to do a motion like this while it's processing around. And if I do that, now I've got a DE that looks like um, this equation here, but I don't have a constant in the end, so I can't solve it as a quadratic. I can't solve it very easily at all. Um, it actually ends up being a really tough problem, and the smarter way to do it is actually to consider the total energy instead, T plus U. Okay, if I do it, um, what I'm going to have is an energy and I'll let you work this through for yourself. You can take your T and your U and instead of subtracting them to get the Lagrangian, you add them. You can then substitute in um, various bits and pieces into here and what you'll get is a half lambda one theta dot squared plus LZ minus L3 cos theta squared on 2 lambda 1 sine squared theta plus L3 squared on 2 lambda 3 plus MGR cos theta, okay? I'll let you work that one through for yourself just for a bit of practice. But this thing basically looks like a half lambda 1 theta dot squared plus an effective potential in theta, right? And so what we can do is plot the energy as a function of theta. And now we have this effective potential energy term looking a little bit like this, um, between some angle theta one and some angle theta two, where our total energy for the system is. And so you know, pi on two would be somewhere here. And so um, you can imagine that there's some minimum and some freedom for the motion to, of um, theta to sort of bounce backwards and forwards in here, right? Um, and then how phi will vary in that particular case um, is then given by um, 
LZ minus L3 cos theta on um, lambda 1 sine squared um, theta um, as we showed above. So let me just explain that one for a second because I just wanted to get it written down. You remember back up when we did this logic up here, what we said was um, if theta is constant and theta double dot is um, constant, that's fine. But we also said that if theta is constant by our equation 3, then our theta dot is going to be constant. We took that from equation 3. All right, so let's go back up and find equation 3. What we said here was that um, if our theta is constant, this term is actually fixed. But now our theta is not constant, so this term is no longer fixed. It will obey this equation. Okay, So that's where that came from. Um, if I think about what my theta dot is um, in terms of uh, my motion in here, um, now I've got basically the speed that I'm going around my precession with. Okay, So if I allow theta to change, which is this direction, I've got an argument that's now con connected to how my um, precessional angle goes around, right? So relaxing the cone, relaxing the speed around the cone. And so what I get is two different behaviours in here that are kind of interesting, and they're behaviours called mutation. So what will happen is um, if I'm sitting down inside this minimum down here, what I'll get is just a clean oscillation backwards and forwards, right? So um, if I consider sort of um, my... Rot I'll use to this because it's more visible. Um, if I rotate to this, I would normally go around like this with my precession. Now I'm allowing an effect called mutation, which is like this as it works its way around, right? Assume it's still spinning. I can't do it very easily, but um, it's going around like this. And you can see that trajectory of, the, of a sort of spinning axis point like this, okay? It's just clean oscillation. You'll notice in the first version of the motion, I'm always moving forward in my precession. I can get into a situation in this problem where um, I actually go backwards in this. So I can get into a situation where I'm sort of going around in a circle like this and get this sort of interesting bouncing motion coming out, right? Um, I don't really want to get tied into the maths too much because I've sort of been very quick and loose with this, but I just want to highlight that there is a behavior. And so this is why rotational mechanics problems get very, very difficult very, very quickly because you've got a large number of parameters, large number of angles, large number of the cross products interact all the terms, and you can get some really interesting behaviors popping out that mathematically are rather challenging to deal with. Okay, And this is this effect called notation, mutation. So let's just have a quick look at this um, in real life. We'll start up our system again. So this is a rapidly rotating gyroscope. You can see it's processing around um, here. And we've kind of missed the um, motion that I wanted to show. It happened at the start. Um, so when you pick this up and let it go at the start, you'll notice that it bounces. And so that's that mutation motion. It, in this particular case, it wipes itself out pretty quickly, but you can set it up in the right dynamics so that it's a sustainable motion that runs as a function of time and you get these sorts of things. And if you're doing sort of motions of planets and stuff like that, then you'll get these sorts of effects on top of things. And so if you're an astronomer, you'll definitely come back and see this sort of thing again um, in your later rotational motion problems. Okay, so I think... That's pretty much everything for my part of the course. We've come through, we did um, Lagrangian approach. We now know how to use that as an apparatus. We did some trivial problems. We did some harder problems. Today we did a really, really hard problem. Um, we've done oscillatory motion and we've sort of built on from simple harmonic oscillators you saw in first year to forced and damped. And then in this last part of the course, we've looked at rotation. And again, there's some things that you had in first year. And now we've shown that you can very quickly get to very hard problems where you get quite complicated um, behaviors of motion out. And if you want to deal with them, you need more than a one hour lecture or a 20 minute exam question to really do that properly. It's, they become longer, more complicated problems. Hope you've enjoyed the course. That's it for me. Thanks for watching.
Hello, students. School has begun. The summer is over. I am in command. What was that? For that little outburst, each and every one of you will spend three hours in detention today, immediately after school, in the basement. What do you think you're doing? Twisted sister, what kind of a man desecrates a defenseless textbook? I've got a good mind to slap your fat face. You are destroying your life with that, that, that garbage. All right, Mr. Sister, I want you to tell me. No, better yet, stand up and tell the class. What do you want to do with your life? I want to go to UNSW and study physics. And then, I want to rock!